There's an important connection between chaos and fractals in that most chaotic systems have fractal state space structure. If you slice the Lorentz attractor crosswise, for instance, that is, if you do a spatial Poincaré section of it using a sectioning plane that cuts across the attractor right here, you get what's called a Cantor set. The way you construct a Cantor set is to repeatedly take chunks out of a line segment. What I'm showing you here is the first three iterations in the construction of what's called the middle third Cantor set where the operation at each step is to remove the middle third of each line segment that's left. To get the real object, you'd have to repeat that iterative removal process an infinite number of times. The key here is that this set is self-similar. If you zoomed in on this chunk, or this chunk, or this chunk, those zoomed-in views would be indistinguishable if you were zooming in on the full Cantor set. That's the nature of a fractal like the bifurcation diagram of the logistic map from the second unit of this course. You could take out other sized chunks from the middle of the line segment too, of course. You could, for example, remove the middle fifth. Think about the difference between the two Cantor sets I just drew. Intuitively, this second one, where I removed the middle fifth, should occupy more space, in some sense, because I'm taking out smaller chunks at each iteration. But our traditional definition of dimension doesn't allow for us to talk like that. It only allows sets to have integer dimension, zero for points, one for lines, two for things that occupy parts of the plane, three for things that fill up solid volumes, and so on and so forth. And a whole bunch of n-dimensional sets still add up only to a dimension of n. If we want to capture the nature of a Cantor set as more than a bunch of zero-dimensional points, in some sense, but less than a one-dimensional line, we need a definition of dimension that can take on non-integer values. Hence the name fractal, which Benoit Mendelbo first used to describe objects that were between integer dimensions. Fractal dimension allows you to meaningfully distinguish between the middle third Cantor set and the middle fifth Cantor set. It's a formalization of my hand-waving statement that the latter should occupy more space in some sense. There are lots of variants of fractal dimension. I'm just going to show you one. It's called the capacity dimension or the box counting dimension. Here's the formula. The idea here is that you take your object, you cover it with balls of radius epsilon, and you see how many it takes to do that. That's the n of epsilon in the top of this formula. The epsilon is the size, and then you take the limit of the ratio of the logs to get the capacity dimension. Here's what I mean by that. Then you change the ball size, see how the number required to cover the object changes. And that's what this definition captures. Okay, now we need to talk a little bit about balls. A ball of radius epsilon, the idea is you stand on a point and you reach out with your arm, if your arm is epsilon long, and you reach in all directions, every point that you can reach with that arm is inside a ball of radius epsilon. Now, I said if your arm is epsilon long, there are lots of different ways to measure length, and that's going to get us into the concept of a norm, which is the generalized mathematical term for how you measure things. In everyday life, we tend to use the Euclidean norm. The Euclidean norm measures distance as the crow flies. But that doesn't work in Manhattan, for instance, where you have to stick to the streets and the avenues. If you're trying to get from 7th Avenue and 46th Street to 10th Avenue and 48th Street, you can't go diagonally through the buildings. There you have to measure walking distance differently, and that's a different norm. There are tons of different norms, and all of them make the epsilon ball shape different. In the Euclidean norm, balls are n-dimensional spheres, like the coins. If we use the L1 norm, a ball looks like a diamond, and if we use the L infinity norm, it looks like a square. And if I draw them all to scale, it looks like this. Not very well drawn, but you get the idea. You don't need to remember the norm names or which one maps to which shape. One of the nice things about norms is that it generally shouldn't matter which one you use in a given calculation, which frees us up to use balls 
whose shape makes the calculation of the capacity dimension easier. Generally, that's the L infinity norm, the one that's a square in 2D or a cube in 3D. What do you think an epsilon ball looks like in 1D if we use the L infinity norm? That is, if you're a 1D creature living on a line with epsilon long arms, how far could you reach? You could reach epsilon in each direction. So an epsilon ball in 1D with the L infinity norm, actually with most norms, is a line segment 2 epsilon long. Now it actually doesn't matter in the calculation of the capacity dimension whether we use balls of radius epsilon or balls of diameter epsilon. And the calculation is often easier if you use epsilon diameter balls. So how many epsilon diameter balls, which look like this, would it take to cover the unit line segment, which runs from 0 to 1? It would take 1 over epsilon of them. How to think about that? If epsilon is half of a unit long, it would take 2 of them. If epsilon is 1 -fifth of a unit long, it would take 5 of them, and so on and so forth. Let's plug that back into the capacity dimension definition. Here's what you get, and that's pretty easy to evaluate. You don't even need to take the limit. It's 1, and that's good. We want the fractal dimension to kind of collapse down to be the same as the topological dimension if the object really is 1D. Now, a little bit about this limit. Remember that fractals are self-similar. That is, if you keep zooming in on them, you keep seeing more structure. That limit gets at that. In this particular case, it doesn't matter because the thing inside the limit doesn't depend on epsilon. Now, there's actually a scaling term in the full definition that makes this work for balls of radius epsilon without having an extra factor of 2 flying around, as well as for line segments of any length, but I'm going to leave that out here. Next example, the unit square. What kind of balls are we going to use to cover this thing up? We could certainly think of using balls like that, but that would be a bit of a pain. It's much easier to use L infinity norm shaped balls that are epsilon on a side then it's very easy to figure out how many of those you need to cover up this thing. You're going to need 1 over epsilon of those balls to cover the horizontal direction, and you're going to need 1 over epsilon of those balls to cover in the vertical direction. So overall, you're going to need 1 over epsilon squared balls to cover the whole object. If we plug that back into the capacity dimension definition, that's what we get. And then you need to use one of the tricks that you may remember from logs, which is log of a to the b is b log a. That will bring the 2 down here, and then these terms cancel, so the answer is 2. And that's also good. Remember, we want the fractal dimension to collapse down to the topological dimension if we're calculating the fractal dimension of an object that is not fractal. Let's try this calculation on an object that is fractal, the middle third Cantor set. I'm going to do this by constructing a table. The first column in this table is the iteration number, that is, how many times the middle thirding operation has been carried out on the set. The second column is how many balls you need to cover it. And the third column is the size of the balls that you would use to cover it. Now at the zeroth step, we could cover this thing with one ball that was one long. I'm assuming that the canter set is ranging from zero to one here. After the first step, we could get away with covering it with two balls, each of which is one third long. After the second step, we would need four balls to cover it, each of which is one ninth long. And you can see the general pattern here. After the kth iterate, the number of balls would be 2 to the k, and the size of the balls would be 1 over 3 to the k. Now as we go down through this table, that's like letting epsilon go to zero and that limit. And that's the same thing as letting n go to infinity. And now we're ready to write down the capacity dimension of the middle third Cantor set. The denominator here is 1 over 1 over 3 to the k. Now we use the log of a to the b equals b log a trick again. That k will come down here. That k will come down there. They will cancel, and we're left with log 2 over log 3, which is about 0.63. And that makes sense for the Cantor set, because it's between 0 and 1. The Cantor set is more than a bunch of points and less than a whole line segment. Returning to that connection between fractals and chaos. Many, not all. This is not an if and only if. There are chaotic systems that do not have fractal state space structure, Anasov systems on the torus for those who are interested, and there are a ton of fractals that have nothing to do with dynamics at all, let alone chaotic dynamics. We talked about this a little bit in the second unit. Indeed, this slide is a rerun.
This is a misconception that turns up a lot in the popular science press, that chaos and fractals are inextricably linked, and it is not true. But there is something to this connection between fractals and chaos, even if it's not an if and only if. And for that reason, it's really important to know something about fractals and something about fractal dimension and how to calculate it. That's a very common thing that people do to attractors, and you'll see how to do that in the next couple of units.